So the recording has begun. Um, some of you have your cameras on and you're very welcome to do so. Um, I just thought that you should know in case you didn't want your camera on. Um, please keep yourself on mute as you enter unless uh, we open it up for questions. And uh, we're going to get started. So um, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, and here you see our agenda for the day. Uh, first, we're going to have a presentation on the Pennsylvania Foundation skills. Um, and then oh, Amanda okay. is going to come on and talk about. Um, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Um, Amanda is going to come on and talk about um, some items of interest to you. Um, and then at the end, we have a little bit of kudos for some of you. Um, so. Before I turn it over to Chuck, Kaylin, and Destiny to talk about the PA Foundation skills and to, to show you uh, what they look like on the website and talk about their uh, content, um, I wanted to talk about sort of the idea uh, for all of this and where, you know, where it came from. Because, you know, we had the Foundation Skills Framework for years and um, they were great. People used them. They were really helpful. Um, in planning instruction and helping students to get the skills they needed. Um, but, you know, they were they had been around for quite a while. And uh, then the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act um, was uh, passed and it included a definition of uh, workplace preparation skills, uh, workforce preparation skills. And um, the way they were defining it was that it included basic academic skills, critical thinking skills, digital literacy skills, and self-management skills. So it kind of incorporated a little bit more than the original foundation skills framework included. So we thought it needed um, a revamp. And um, so we got together as a group at the uh, professional development system and did a lot of research. And here is what we came up with. And I believe I'm turning it over to Chuck. Mm, no, no, Kaylin. Kaylin, sorry. It's, yes, it's coming to Kaylin. Got it. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, um, Christine. So we're going to start by talking about the workforce preparation skills. So as you know, workforce preparation skills are not standalone skills taught in isolation. Rather, they are integrated into all of your lessons for your adult students. So as Christine had mentioned, um, WIOA identifies workforce preparation skills that include critical thinking skills, digital literacy skills, self-management skills, and the self-management skills include utilizing resources, using information, working with others, understanding systems, and skills necessary for successful transition into post-secondary education or training and employment. So the PA foundation skills illustrate this with the label that combines the digital literacy skills and the transferable skills. So we're gonna take a closer look at both of these categories that combine to make up the workforce preparation skills. So you can see, can we have the next slide please? You can see the band that combines these two skills shows that they are the workforce preparation skills, and it's the combination of the digital literacy skills and the transferable skills. And again, these are especially important with integration into your classroom lessons, and it's the also the integrated and contextualized component for integrated education and training, or IET. So that's where the workforce preparation skills are located on the entire PA foundation skills. Next slide, please. So as we mentioned, these are the subcategories that combine to create what we have labeled transferable skills. Some of these may look familiar from the previously used foundation skills framework, and others are combination of the skills identified in the foundation skills framework 
but albeit updated with 2022 information, as Christine had mentioned, as well as information from other resources, such as the employability skills framework. So you can see that section, that transferable skills, which is what we called them, which, which is what part of the definition from WIOA is they are the transferable skills, include those that we mentioned. And again, they're, they may look familiar because some of the words are very familiar from the previous foundation skills framework. Next slide, please. So you'll see on this slide an example of how the transferable, remember there are one component of the workforce preparation skills, the other is the digital literacy skills, how they are defined and explained in the PA foundation skills. Each identified transferable skill includes a definition, multiple competencies, and accompanying indicators for each competency. So let's look at what you see on your screen, critical thinking. The PA foundation skills define this skill as thinks clearly and rationally with an open mind to arrive at decisions or conclusions by examining evidence, analyzing relationships, and drawing con conclusions from a variety of data. This slide also shows an example of a competency for this skill. Observes critically. The previous foundation skills framework had these as separate skills, but the PA foundation skills combine them and categorize them together to more closely align with the examples in WIOA. And then finally, you'll see several indicators that further define the competency. These indicators serve as examples, but you could potentially have other indicators based on the skills that you're teaching in your integrated lessons. Next slide, please. Finally, this slide shows how all of the pieces of the transferable skills are presented in the foundation skills. So you can see the, the skill is mentioned, the definition, the list of competencies that are numbered 1.1, 1.2, or 2.1, 2.2. And they help, they're, they're listed that way to help you as instructors and student support coordinators keep them more organized and introduce them to your students as well. You'll also see that the competencies are listed with the example for critical thinking. We'll see that includes observes critically, solves problems, makes decisions using reasoning, processes processes and analyzes information. And again, some of those are very familiar from the foundation skills framework, and they may have been their own skills in that previous version of our workforce preparation skills. And finally, you'll see the indicators with little check boxes. Again, these are the kinds of tools that you can use with students who can check off different boxes when they achieve competency or, or when they're able to do some of those tasks. Um, so that you'll see things, if you're familiar with the old foundation skills framework, there are very many things that are familiar. Um, so we're hoping that the transition to using the PA foundation skills um, is a smooth one. So next I'm going to turn the presentation over to Chuck Klinger, who will introduce the digital literacy skills. Remember, that is the other component of workforce preparation skills in the Pennsylvania, in the PA Foundation skills. Chuck? Hey, thanks, Kaylin. Hi, everybody. Um, you know, the first thing I'd like to mention is our, our project, our team did a lot of research into, there were a lot of existing digital literacy skills, digital literacy competencies, things like that. And there was a lot of variety in how they approached them. Um, you know, Many of you are probably familiar with North Star, the digital literacy assessment um, program that also has their own digital literacy standards. They're very focused on specific products, like how you use specific types of technology. For example, how do you use Word? How do you use PowerPoint? How do you use um, Windows and things like that? Um, at the other end of the spectrum, um, the ISTE standards, um, which is the International Society for Technology and Education, uh, they had standards that I guess you could say are a little more cerebral. Um, they had a, a lot to do with how people, how students value technology, 
how they decide to use technology, how they think about technology. And, um, and you know, there are other products or other sets of standards that are anywhere in between, probably most notably the Seattle Digital Equity Standards. Uh, there, there, was a, there was a project done in the city of Seattle around that. Um, so we looked at a lot of different types of standards. We probably leaned a little more towards how people use technology and how they think technology. Um, so that's kind of how we came about uh, developing these these uh, the digital literacy skills that you're going to see. Uh, so we have four domains, um, basic computer and mobile skills, internet skills, communication skills, and information literacy skills. So those are kind of the four broad areas that we identified that we would develop skills within. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So the layout of the skills is within each of those domains, there are um, more specific skills. So here's an example of the first one under basic uh, computer and mobile skills, which is optimizes operating system functionality. And as you can see, so it's not necessarily specific to Windows or Android or iOS or anything like that. It's just more a general ability to optimize operating systems. Um, and then within each of these skills, we have three levels. Um, and as you can see, we titled them levels one, two, and three. Um, level one is usually the more basic um, level. And level one usually involves using directions like following procedures that may be given by the teacher, or by a tutorial, something like that. Uh, working with very specific and familiar technologies or products, software, hardware, things like that. Level two usually involves starting to work a little bit more independently, um, showing a little bit more initiative, and then level three usually involves working completely independently and possibly transferring the skills that you have working with one um, product to another. So for example, um, you know, I use Zoom regularly and I can use the skills that I have with Zoom to use Microsoft Team without really having to struggle too much. So that's kind of the way that we have the, the digital skills laid out. Um, next slide, please. And as you can see there, we also have a checklist uh, similar to what Kaylin mentioned for the transferable skills and it outlines the, you know, the domain, as you can see with the yellowish orange arrow, um, you know, number one, basic computer and mobile. Um, then the reddish arrow points to the specific competencies within each of those. And then that box to the right, um, that's that's kind of highlighted by the greenish arrow where it says tasks. Um, those are the individual levels so that you can kind of check with your students as you work through which of the um, which of the levels they're at for each of the competencies that you may be interested in focusing on with your students. Um, we do have a kind of like a number coding system similar to what Caitlin mentioned with the transferable skills. Um, and kind of for the same reason, there's not going to be any quizzes on, you know, our projects never going to say, you know, you have to know these numbers or, you know, anything like that, but just to help you maybe shorthand as you're writing lessons or, you know, as you're trying to refer to the different digital literacy skills. Um, that is the digital literacy skills in a nutshell. So um, I'll turn it over to, I think, Destiny or Christine. Yep. Christine. <laughs> All right. Um, and this is very short. Um, we also included in the PA Foundation skills uh, the academic skills because, as I said, they were mentioned in the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act um, definition. And then additionally, we thought it was really important that uh, instructors could go to sort of one place when they're, you know, writing their lessons. Um, there's a lot of uh, elements that they need to incorporate. You know, they they want to incorporate some of the transferable skills and they want to incorporate digital literacy skills. And, you know, of course, the CCRS and the English language proficiency standards that we have all been using. So these were included as sort of the, the third prong 
of the PA Foundation skills. And now we're going to turn it over to Destiny. Hi everyone, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So if you give me one second, please. Um, I'm going to load. I'm really happy to be showing you some of the great resources that Kaylin uh, and Chuck's team both developed in order to help uh, both your staff as well as your learners use these resources in order to identify the skills they need and um, kind of mark their progress as they're going along. So I, before I start um, talking about the website, I just want to make sure everyone can see it OK. Um, I can see it, Destiny. OK, great. Thank you. So uh, we have a page that's called the PA Foundation Skills that's on the Pennsylvania Adult Education Resources. Hopefully you're all familiar with this website, but if it's new to you, you can go to www.paadultedresources.org. And this website has a lot of resources for you and also your staff. Um, but the PA Foundation Skills are located under two areas. Uh, you can get to them either from the Standards and Skills page or the Workforce and Career Pathways page. Both places will take you to the exact same page. Uh, and as I'm walking through this, this is something that uh, we hope that you'll share with your uh, staff. Um, and in addition, some of your instructors or student support coordinators may want to show your students how to do this so that they can build their digital literacy skills, um, their internet skills, uh, their basic computer skills, as they're um, accessing resources uh, from this site as well. So under PA Foundation Skills, what you'll see is there's a graphic that uh, Tessa Gross uh, developed, which helps show all the skills and the pieces together. And that might be a nice way to show your staff for sure, and even your learners, kind of the types of skills that they're working on to help them reach their educational and workforce goals. On this page, you'll also see the list uh, where you can download the full list of transferable skills. Um, when you click on this, it'll open up that PDF that Kaylin talked about. And once again, this would be a great way for your learners to practice downloading a resource, opening up a PDF, saving it as they mark the progress. In addition, there's also the full list of the digital digital literacy skills checklist, the CCRS uh, standards and the ELPS. If you scroll a little further down though, what we did in order to help your staff that may be doing instructional planning or your learners that may be focusing on a specific skill, we created individual pages that would allow them to see what skills are specific to uh, each area. So for example, if someone clicks on basic computer and mobile skills, they'll give it'll give uh, people a quick glance of what the skills look like. In addition to that, they can download just the basic computer skills skills. So if, for example, if a teacher or instructor, uh, student support coordinator, tutor uh, wanted to have learners focus on a specific set, they could give them just this list separated out rather than the full list um, if that might help learners focus or um, eliminate kind of being overwhelmed with the full list. In addition to that, uh, when you go to that page, uh, they can also download the full digital literacy skills list and um, go back to the PA Foundation skills page. For the transferable skills, it's the same setup where they'll click on critical thinking skills. Um, once again, they can download the skills just for uh, that uh, competency and then also um, the full list as well. So we hope that you'll find these resources helpful and useful. We'd love to hear your feedback on them. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Thanks, Destiny. That was great. Um, I'm really excited about this resource. So uh, we have, if uh, Chuck, Destiny, and Kaylin can stay on, um, and we have some time for questions before I turn it back over to Amanda. Um, does anyone have any questions for the team that developed this resource? You can either unmute or put a question in the chat. Yeah, this is Tim Shank, and I'm wondering how you would go about assessing these skills to determine whether a learner has mastered the skill or not? Chuck or Kaylin, do you want to take that question? Chuck, why, uh, Chuck, why, why don't you take a stab at it and I'll see how we're thinking about it. OK, yeah, I think um, you know, especially specifically for the digital literacy skills, some of it can be through observation, through, um, you know, seeing how, seeing how students 
use technology in the classroom, digital literacy skills in the classroom. One of the things for those of you that use Northstar that we're working on, and we've kind of completed, I guess, but we're, we're working on formatting and, and finalization and things like that, but is a crosswalk between the digital literacy skills that, that we have as part of the PA Foundation skills and the Northstar. So we, we did like a crosswalk to the North Star standards, and we're working on kind of adjusting that to the North Star assessments. As you know, like I mentioned, it's a little bit of a different. It's it's not going to be a real clean apples to apples, but for those of you that do use North Star, it can kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what assessments work with which of this which of the digital literacy skills. Um, and I think that that's something that we're going we're working on a resource list as well. So I, you know, I think that it's it's something that. So, like I said, I would say the North Star um, assessments. There are some other digital literacy assessments that we're starting to look at as well, but North Star seems to be the one that a lot of adult ed programs are using. So we're trying to figure out the best way for you to use that. And then, like I said, a observation. Um, you know, thinking about the lessons and you know how well students are able to use, especially when you target certain skills within a lesson and how well the students perform in those lessons. Hopefully yeah, that I, makes sense. Oh. Sorry, Caitlin, go ahead. No, that yeah, no, that was great. I'll, I'll just add a little bit to that. Yeah, so there are no standardized tests for for the transferable skills. I will say that. Um, I mean, there there you might find something that looks like a standardized test, but like Chuck said, you know, we 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 suggest observation. Um, you know, using using a rubric to kind of decide are they beginning, are they emerging, are they competent? Um, the other thing that um, you can do is really develop like opportunities for project based learning where people try to put those skills together to come up with a project working with a team. I know some programs have worked with teaching skills that matter, uh, which which looks a lot at that project based learning and looks at these kinds of skills and ways to introduce them, have students practice them. But I think for, you know, for a lot of it, it's it's helping our students become aware of those skills, that those critical thinking skills are so important in the workplace. They're so important in post secondary education. So even building the language and building the awareness and then giving folks the opportunities to practice them. So it's not something that, you know, you can learn from a book or you can necessarily learn from a, a lesson, but the opportunities to practice those skills, you know, time and time again until they become part of what a, a person does. So the digital literacy is a little different in that respect, um, but those transferable skills are really, um, you know, based on observation, based on competency, based on what you see becoming habits um, and not just one offs because, you know, my example is always if you ask a uh, talking about time management and, and that piece of it, if you ask a student, uh, are you supposed to come to work on time? Are you supposed to come to class on time? Of course, the answer is always going to be yes, but to really show competency, they have to show that they have to demonstrate that they do come to class on time all the time. If it's part of the time, it's practicing, you know, it's making them aware that this is important and this is what you have to do. I get a little long with my answers, but I hope that's that OK. Helps. Thanks. Kaylin. I hope that was um, helpful. I just want to also include that Amanda indicated in the chat, you know, that just uh, to inform everyone in case they don't know that there are, uh, you know, no assessments currently approved uh, for assessing development and progress in these areas. So there's nothing uh, what I'll say in quotes official out there. Um, we had a question in the chat. Um, well, I'm not sure if it's a question or a statement. Since mobile Christine, is in the... Yes, Amanda. Can I, can I jump in and add something? Bill? Certainly. Um, so for those of you who are doing workplace literacy classes, so that's not, that's not, a, that's not your regular adult education classes that you're incorporating workforce preparation activities into. That's where you're providing adult basic education instruction um, on site at a local employer. 
and you've determined, you've worked with the employer to determine the skills that um, the either incumbent workers or workers who are going to be employed there, that they're going to need it to be able to do their job. And you're working with that employer to make sure they have those basic skills needs. Under WIOA now, a, a student in that type of class can show a measurable skill gain by showing progress on a progress report as determined by the employer that you've been working with, that they're showing progress in those skills that the employer has identified as the purpose of this workplace literacy class. And so in that particular case, you could use aspects of the PA Foundation skills to identify the competencies that the employer thinks is important and that will be the focus of your um, your instruction and the classes. And then you would work with the employer to determine what is progress in that area going to look like and how will we determine that they have reached a level or that they're showing progress towards it. So for that type of class, um, a workplace literacy class, um, you know, Tim, that doesn't completely answer your question because I'm not telling you how to assess it, but you would work with the employer to identify the competencies and, you know, where are they now and how does the employer determine, you know, that there's a need in this area and then how will you and the employer work together to identify the progress or ultimately the achievement of the skill to the employer's satisfaction. So that is one type of class. It's very specific and many of you are not providing it, but it is one type of uh, activity that is allowable with our funding. And that is a way to use these PA foundation skills to show measurable skill gain for those individuals um, that is not you know, a pre and post test on one of our assessments that is not necessarily aligned to the purposes of this workplace literacy class. Thanks for the clarification, Amanda. Amanda, how is that reported? Amanda, you're on mute. Oh. Thank you for letting me know that there is a section in eData. There's a tab called Measurable Skill Gains Post-Secondary Education. It was added at the end of last year. This, this new way of showing measurable skill gain is new as of 21-22. Uh, the feds just started allowing it. Um, so we just added it to eData at the end of the last year. And there are instructions in the manual on how to report that. Um, I want to get back to um, someone who put a question in the chat. Um, since mobile is in the title, are we helping students use their phones more efficiently? Chuck, would you like to field that? Sure. Yeah. Um, within the basic skill, or I'm sorry, um, basic computer and mobile, the one of the competencies or one of the skills has to do with using mobile devices. So I don't know that I'd say that it's a requirement that you do that, but it's something that is, you know, it, it definitely is a skill in today's society. So I think that that's, um, you know, something that, yeah, that I think I should is, um, you know, I guess maybe a word that I'm a little bit stuck on, um, or are we helping students use them? I think, you know, I think it depends on the student and what, what types of devices they're using. Yeah, so, you know, I'll chime in here a little bit, Chuck, I th and then Amanda can, uh, you know, chime in or correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that, you know, is a phone the ideal way for a student to do their classwork or to learn? No, probably not. Um, you know, we're trying, I think a goal should be to get, um, you know, compute laptops or Chromebooks or iPads uh, into their hands so that they can, you know, um, do a little more with their digital skills that are applicable perhaps to uh, workforce activities. Um, but the reality is that some students only have the phone. So I think we need to um, address that reality. 
Um, and if that is the case, I think that it is, you know, perfectly acceptable to, um, you know, work on those skills for them, you know, so that they can access resources on their own. Amanda, did uh, you want to add to that or? Uh, no, no, I mean, I think. I, I think when you when we're talking, well, OK, so yes, I will. I said no. OK, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think. I think when we talk about technology with our students, we want to kind of talk about all of the technology that they're using, right? So, you know, those of us who have smoke, smartphones, smartphones, which is probably the majority of people so far, or at this point, right? It's um, we're we're very often accessing the same information whether we're on our cell phones or we're on a, a tablet or we're on our laptop or we're on a, P, a PC, right? We're we're still accessing websites and um, you know maybe on the phone it's an app, but on your on your computer it's a website, but you're ultimately dealing with the same thing. So I think helping you know, part of digital literacy is helping students understand all of the technology that they may interact with and how they, you know, how they align with each other and what some, you know, unique aspects of them are. That's that's part of understanding technology. And I think that would get to, Christine, what you said is a student may realize once they understand all their options that, OK, you know, yes, I could do this on my phone, but maybe that's not the best way to do it. So I'll take advantage of one of the tablets that the program is offering me instead of trying to do it on my phone, that that kind of thing. Thank you. All right, um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, if you have further questions about this, please reach out to, um, you know, Chuck, Kaylin or Destiny. Um, with your questions, and I guess we will move on to our next topic. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Amanda. Thank you. And just a reminder to everyone that you may want to check to see whether or not you're on video because this is being recorded. You're, as Christine has indicated, you're welcome to remain on video. Um, but if you are on video, if you have your camera on, you will be recorded with your camera on for posterity's sake. <laughs> and we do we do post these to the website. So um, so I just have some uh, some updates and some clarifications, etc. So I'm I'm not sure how many of you know this. I don't know if GED has sent out their official notice yet, but <clears throat> they are there will be a price increase as of July 1st of this year, it will be increasing uh, to $36 per subtest. That actually has um, that actually has been the price for those people who were doing the the online proctoring, the remote proctoring. <clears throat> so now what GED has done is um, brought the price of the uh, tests done at testing centers in to up to the same level. Um, it will have one. Um, it will have one. Free retest for the thirty six dollars. Um, after that, the individual will have to pay again. Um, that's the information that I have. GEDTS will be sending out kind of a, a press release, a notification, and they will have FAQs on their website if you have any specific questions. Uh, the high set is a completely different test. Um, you know, we do not uh, we do not determine the base price for the tests. Um, you know, we would if we wanted to charge an additional amount, that's what we would do. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so July 1st, 2023, GED test will go up to $36 per subtest. Uh, additional questions should go to GED testing service. Um, at this point, I don't know anything about the high set prices. Um, I do know that there are still issues with PSI and um, scores um, and scores being transferred to diploma sender 
um, PSI is not necessarily getting the data correctly and completely to Diploma Sender. This is not just in Pennsylvania, this is across the board. Um, you know, if you're in an area where both the GED test and the HiSET are available, you may want to recommend that the students do the GED for the time being, given the issues that are happening with HiSET. But, um, you know, I it, it could be that in your area, HiSET is working just fine and there are no pro problems. And if individuals are getting their test scores into Diploma Center and they're getting their credential without any issues, then, of course, that's fine. That's that's why we have both tests so that students have options. My next slide. Um, OK, so we have a couple of slides around professional development. Um, we've we've been getting some. Questions, requests, uh, requests for clarification um, as a result of the, the fact that we implemented the requirement for 2% of staff time to be spent on professional development. So first of all, we will provide um, additional guidance in our 2023-24 guidelines. Uh, so we've made notes to make uh, to add information to that um, to that document. Um, some some clarifications for the time being that the two percent is for paid staff. It does not apply to your volunteer classroom aides. Um, you know, we did hear from some programs that they were they were struggling with volunteer classroom aides because the aides did not want to do the two percent. Um, it was never intended for them to do it. It is paid staff. Um, also, you know, part of the um, the sixteen ninety two uh, tutor training expenditures can be well, is supposed to be really the um, teacher working with the classroom aide to understand how they're going to support the students that they're going to be working with. Um, and that, you know, that really kind of is the professional development for the aide. They're learning what they need to do in order to support the students. So, um, you know, if your teachers are working with their classroom aides the way they should be to help them prepare to work with the students, those volunteer classroom aides are kind of actually getting uh, PD. Um, you know, they're learning things and it's job embedded. Uh, the other thing we wanted to clarify is it's a it's a minimum, right? Well, we put this in because there were people who were not participating in PD at all. Um, but it's not it's not a maximum, it's not a limit. So if if your staff and your budget allow for you to have teachers um, participate in additional professional development time, um, or you want to require them to uh, participate in additional time, that that's fine. So that you're not limited to 2%. It's that's a minimum, not a maximum. Also, it does uh, it does say in the guidelines that it does not apply to administrative support staff. Um, and uh, we did not specifically say this, but um, we also did not intend for it to apply to data entry staff. So the people, not the people who are reviewing um, data for accuracy and, and supporting staff to use the data, the data, that's the data quality specialist. But if you have data entry staff, um, they of course have to do introduction to e-data when they start. Um, and we recommend that they participate in the Friday MIS webinars, but those are not required. And data entry staff are not required to do the two, the, well, we'll say the two point, boy, the 2% requirement does not apply to your data entry staff. Um, next slide. So what what is professional development? Because um, it, it is a term that kind of is used in lots of different ways in different areas. So what we mean by professional development is formal and informal means of assisting staff in acquiring new knowledge, skills, and approaches, exploring new or advanced understanding of content theory and resources, developing new insights into theory and its application to improve the effectiveness of the current practice and lead to professional growth. And in Pennsylvania, 
the professional development that staff participate in needs to have a job embedded component. So professional development activities include courses, individual coaching or technical assistance, participation in professional learning communities, as long as there is an opportunity for the staff to implement their learning as a planned part of the activity. Okay, so um, I think there were some, I think there were some people who thought that it had to be, um, I thought, who thought that it had to be one of the courses. Um, and that that's absolutely not the case. You know, professional learning community time is about as job embedded as you can get, right? You're you're talking, st the staff are meeting together to talk about their practices and, and share learning and then building on that and taking it back to the classroom and implementing um, what they've what they've discussed and, and building on it. So the, the professional learning communities are definitely uh, professional development time for the purposes of the two percent. Um, we have a question in the chat if it would be possible for you to copy and paste that um, definition you just uh, read off oh, and put it, okay. put it in the chat. I don't have access to the notes right now, so I can't do it. Yeah. And we'll be adding that definition to the guidelines next year, as Amanda indicated. We'll be updating the guidelines. Hi, did that did that come through okay? Yep. And there, I don't. There may be typos in there. Or something we I don't think we were planning on have, copying and pasting it. So that was those were just from my notes. So uh, if there are any typos or anything, apologies. Um. So then, what what isn't professional development? Um. You know, anything that is just an information dump. So this webinar is not professional development. It's an information dump. We're we're providing you with information and that's it. There's, you know, some of it may ultimately apply to your work, but this is not professional development. This is an information dump. Um, we're presenting things. Now, something can be valuable, <laughs> and worth participating in, but not be professional development. So most webinars, um, we don't consider professional development. You know, most a conference keynote session, you know, that, that's not professional development. It might be interesting, it might be inspiring, um, but it's not professional development. Most conference sessions are really just, you're sitting there listening, you know, you might, engage in an activity related to it, but it's not, you're not applying it to your work. It's not job embedded. Um, we are this year allowing um, programs to use uh, PACE for six hours of uh, professional development, but I, I do want to stress, PACE is still beneficial, right? It's still a good thing for your staff to do. It's a good place for networking, talking to other people, but it's not, we don't, we don't consider it job embedded. Um, however, pre-conference workshops, um, because those are an extended focused um, activity to develop skills, which we assume are related to the person's job, those um, that time can count as professional development or towards the, the, 20, the 2%. Um, you know, podcasts and lectures are all very interesting. For our purposes, they're not professional development. Okay, uh, next slide. So there I just said, just because it is, isn't PDE, it doesn't mean it's not. So the, the other confusion I think maybe that came up is as, as long as it is a reasonable and necessary activity and tied to the work of the grant, you can still cover the costs, even if it's not the, you know, something for professional development. So you, know, you can still, and we encourage you to, you know, have staff go to PACE and cover the conference fees and the travels. There are other conferences that staff may find useful, uh, such as a, a local uh, TESOL conference, 
there, there are many that happen in the in the state that could be useful. And those are allowable. Um, those are allowable expenses. It's just not PD time. So I, I did want to stress because we got a couple questions that seem to indicate that <clears throat> as a result of putting in this 2% that now people could not go to conferences because we weren't counting it as PD. And that's not the case. They still go to conferences. It's very beneficial. It just doesn't count towards the 2%. Um, Christine, I think there was a, <clears throat> a question that popped up. I don't know if you want to address that one or not. <clears throat> Or is that something that you would uh, prefer to uh, address directly? Um, no, I can I can okay. address it here. I was uh, waiting. I thought I'd wait till you finished the whole PD section, but I will address it. So we have a question. What is considered individual coaching? Um, so, you know, I think I'd be open to, um, you know, s someone saying, you know, we did this internal coaching. But when we talk about coaching, many of our courses have an individual coaching component attached to them. And that coaching may expand beyond the, what the credit is given in the course. So for example, um, Teaching Skills That Matter, which I think many of your agencies did this year, probably involved um, a fair amount of individual coaching um, with, with your coach. Um, so we wanna make sure that you can count that time um, for PD, but I think if you had a situation where you had an internal person, you know, like a mentor teacher who was working with a new teacher and coaching them, and then that teacher was implementing some of the things that they learned, um, I, you know, I think I would be open to you counting that, um, you know, it would be up for up to you to track that. And um, if and when you got monitored and we you know, asked you to show your 2%, you would have to have evidence uh, for that. But I think that that is valid. Did I, Cindy, did I answer your question? Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, and um, I, I don't have this on the clarification slide, but as you were talking, Christine, it, it reminded me. So there, um, you know, you, your entity, uh, may have, may provide training, and this is not the mandated training that we're going to talk about on the next slide, but you're, you know, if you're part of a larger educational program and they have, uh, you know, courses on working with adults um, or, or things that a staff member can attend that will support their work, um, you know, part of a, a, a IU or some kind of system that talks about, you know, standards-based instruction, and it would, you know, build on what we've done within our college and career readiness standards, things like that. You know, that's valid, as Christine said, you know, document it um, and, you know, have evidence that shows that this, that it is job embedded and that the staff members are using uh, that work. And we'll we'll consider it. The other thing I wanted to clarify too, because this this was a question that came in. Um, so we do not require any staff in our programs to be certified teachers. Um, we are approved to provide Act Forty Eight credit for PD. There is a process that we go through to determine how much Act 48 time will be awarded. Um, and the courses in the PDE portal have Act 48 times associated with them. And that's the Act 48 that those individuals will get. Now we can, you know, the, the system can review what is actually happening and see if we need to increase the amount a little, but you know, Act 48 is not an individual, this is how much time I spent on it. It's, you know, this is this is how much credit you get it for it. However, if you have a staff member who is doing one of those courses and say the course is worth 15 hours of Act 48, but that individual spends more than 15 hours and you have it documented, 
on, say, timesheets that they are working on PD and they end up working 22 hours on it, that's 22 hours of PD time. So you're not limited. You, know, <clears throat> you can document the staff's actual time working on a professional development activity and count that as their PD time. You're not limited to the Act 48 time, but we're not going to give that person more Act 48. You know, Act 48 is established and awarded. So I hope that um, kind of clarifies the difference between Act 48 versus uh, staff time actually participating in PD. Um, we have another question in the chat, I guess, before we go on, Amanda. Um, can on onboarding meetings with the IHPDS count as PD? Um, so I, I don't know, Sue, um, you know, I, I guess I would have to know what you mean by onboarding. So, um, you know, if it's just uh, like the, the HR stuff. Oh, go ahead, Sue. Yeah. Hi, Christine. So what I was thinking is, so after um, an instructor takes a course and they meet with the IHPDS to discuss and evaluate how implementation of what they learned in the course went in the classroom or something like that. Yeah, I think if it's evaluation of implementation, um, just as long as you have documentation. Right, and you know, so what I would say is onboarding, and I think this is what Christine was getting to. You know, when you when you have a new employee, you sit down and say, okay, here are the rules of the agency. This is how you do attendance. This is when you need to submit it. Here's what our lesson plans look like. That's not PD. That's that's HR and onboarding. But you know, the induction modules that that staff new staff participate in, any required um, trainings that are associated with certain positions. And Christine, as you indicated, the in-house professional development specialist working with the staff to discuss what was learned and how it will be applied and supporting them to apply it in their job. That would be PD time. Um, um, so what I'm going to suggest now is if if people have more questions about does this count, doesn't this count, what do you think of this? Um, I would recommend that you email your advisor and then the advisors and Amanda will discuss it. Um, and if we need to um, disseminate our answers, you know, to, to greater than just the person that asked it, we will. Um, so I, th I think we should move on now. Yeah. OK. Yeah. That we are. Oops, sorry. Yes, we are getting at 1150. Um, the, the last thing, um, and there's a lot of information on this slide. Um, there were, we also got a question. Many organizations have mandated staff training. Uh, you know, here at the Commonwealth, we have a lot of it, right? You're, you have to take active shooter. You have to take uh, IT security, sexual harassment, blah, 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 lots and lots and lots of things. Though, if those are required part of employment at your entity, then yes, you can pay your staff for the time they take that. Um, it is not professional development. It doesn't count to the 2% but you can pay for them. Those of you that get state funds uh, should pay for them out of your state funds because of how uh, the feds look at these activities. They consider them administrative. So if you pay for them out of federal funds, you have to charge them to $2,300 um, on, on your 064 grant. Um, but yes, you can pay them. You would just put it in whatever their most common function code object code is. So if you have a teacher who has to do these trainings, just pay them out of their, you know, 1691, 10, I think three it is. Um, in the 061 grant, which doesn't have any state funds tied to it, we have a, a special function code 2270, which is for staff professional development time. And I know we're saying it's not professional development, but just for, for the purposes of this, please put it in that column. Um, now, if your agency has kind of like a charge to the grant, not for staff time participating in or completing these trainings, but to actually cover the cost of providing the trainings, that has to go in 2300. That's an administrative cost. Okay, thank you. Sorry, next slide. Um, 
So we, we had a question about computer based assessment purchases specifically related to the TABE because TABE, my understanding is TABE has a minimum purchase of $500, which 121 administrations. Um, so we do not have any agencies who have such a small contracted enrollment that you should not be able to use 121 TABE administrations. Um, programs, we really want programs to be using computer-based assessments. You should really, at this point, only be using paper-based assessments for those students for whom computer-based is just not, they're just not able to do computer-based, right? We're talking about building digital literacy skills. Yeah. So, and, and the computer-based assessments, they're far less likely to make errors in them. You as an agency are far less likely to uh, get an incorrect score, all of those things. So no, no agency should be asking another agency to purchase TABE on their behalf. Um, and you know, if you have 30 students, each of whom gets a reading and math, pre-test and a meeting, reading and math post-test, that's 120 administrations. So we understand they're more expensive, um, but you should budget for that. Um, and there are definitely benefits for the student. It also, you know, at the TABE, and I believe the cost is also they, they the computer-based assessments produce reports that you let you know where the students had strengths and weaknesses um, that just, send it out instead of somebody having to sit there and, you know, fill out the bubble forms and things like that. So just wanted to address that. Reminders, if you are a program whose classes are open entry, open exit, and you have space in your classes, you cannot be refusing to bring them into your program just because you're concerned that they're not going to remain long enough to get an educational gain. Okay, so we've heard of programs that said we're not we're not allowing any more new students to come in because they're not going to be here long enough. If you have space, you know, and you're open entry, which means you allow people to come in and leave whenever they want to, uh, then you need to keep enrolling them. Uh, please make sure your data entry is up to date. Um, I will be pulling data on May 1st. Um, and I will be looking at agencies' progress towards contracted enrollment and EFL gains uh, to inform our decisions regarding uh, grant amounts and conditions for next year. And finally, so that we can end on uh, a positive note like we started, <laughs> um, I'd like to give kudos to uh, these five programs. Um, we we hold some pretty high, pretty ambitious targets. So these are five agencies who have greater than 80% enrollment and a pre-post test of greater than 60%. So more than 60% of their students have a pre and post test match. And those people who have been pre and post tested, more than 50% of them have shown an educational functioning level gain. So we have these five programs, the Literacy Center, Project of Easton's Family Literacy Program, Keystone Opportunity Center, New World Association, and VITA's Family Literacy Program have all met those, uh, those pretty high, high thresholds. So congratulations to those five programs. I know many of you are probably close to that, or you may have had one or two of those, not but not the last. So this is not to suggest that any of the rest of you um, are not also successful, but we just wanted to really bring kudos to these agencies for hitting all of those really high bars. Um, Kim Gavlik, did you have a question? Feel free to unmute. No, so sorry, I hit the wrong. I was going to try oh. and clap and I hit the high. I'm <laughs> <five>, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so Kim's raising of her hand was actually a clap for you for the five of you. Um, we can hang on. We're at time, but we can hang yeah. on another minute in case there's any questions. I don't want to rush people who have questions about um, 
any of the last couple slides that Amanda presented. Hi, Amanda. This is Sharon Hagenberger calling and Christine. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, Hi. Once you do the data poll on May 1st, is that then going to determine like when you open the next year of the grant? We're trying to get our federal and state things all organized. Um, I have Kim Topper, of course, so we get things done early. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, um, fabulous. So we were just wondering. I, I don't know. I, I every year I have to send things through the approval process. Um, I will say, um, barring any really poor performance, um, everyone can at least anticipate level funding. So if you're kind of beginning to prepare, um, I, I, you know, I don't, what I will say is I have no idea what's going to be happening with the state budget. Um, you know, I'm functioning on the fact that we'll be level funded, <laughs> that they're not going to cut us any. Um, so I think, you know, if you're beginning planning, you can at least plan for level funding, um, it, unless your program is really, really low, and then I may have to have some conversations with you. Um, but I have to, you know, we, we still have to kind of figure out how much federal money we're going to get, and there'll be de some decision making. We are in the process of building the grants so that they will be ready as soon as we can provide you with the uh, grant award, uh, the, the funding notification letters though. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, well, um, I wanna thank um, Chuck, Kaylin and Destiny um, for a great presentation today. And I wanna congratulate the five agencies on this kudos list. Um, and thank you, Amanda, for all of the interesting information. And thank all of you for the questions. They were uh, thank you good for questions. calling it interesting. <laughs> and we'll, it we'll interesting. actually, if any of you, <laughs> if any of you, or for those of you who are at Pace uh, next week, uh, we will be there. So we will see you. All right. So thanks, everybody. Um, this, you know, the recording will be posted um, within a couple days. And I'm going to stop the recording now. And um, you can log out.